All right, I think this works. I can see my face. <laughs> All right, guys, so let's wait a few seconds for people to come in. Um, and then hopefully everything will be okay. <laughs> oh, man. You know, when Jordan Peterson talks about kind of going into the unknown and doing things you're not used to doing, this is really, this is really for me. This is really the kind of thing that drives me, that makes me extremely nervous. Um, all right. I've never been a very technical person. And so, you know. All right. So this is working. I've got the chat. Let's wait another, another few minutes so that people can come in. I got my images. All right. Okay. So let's, uh, let's go. So I, I wanted to try this as a live chat just because I figure because it's a surprise chat, there won't be too many people. Uh, there won't be too many people in the chat. And so, um, I'll be able to kind of pay attention to what you're saying and maybe interact with you guys a little more than I do in the, uh, in the Q and a, um, and a lot of people have been asking me to do an interpretation of the recent image I did of the flood as a cosmic image. And I wanted to make a color version. I've been, I wanted to make a color version from the start. And so I decided to wait until I had the color version to do the interpretation for you guys. So last week I put it out, um, you know, people can buy it as a print or on merchandise or, or whatever. And, uh, and so I thought, let's do this. Let's do uh, a color version. It has a nice rainbow, which it's just, I just feel like now's the now's a good time to talk about you know images with rainbows. I don't know why, and so so I think that we can we can uh, we can look at the symbolism here, and I'll show you guys at the same time. Hopefully, I can make this work. I'll also try to show you um, some of the images on which it is based because it is not a uh, it's not just a, something that I took out of my imagination, but it's based on uh, several traditional images as well. So I see Brad is in the chat. It's good to see you. Sorry, I didn't warn you and uh, other moderators that I was doing this, but you know, that's how it is. <laughs> okay, so let's go. And so the uh, the image you're seeing is, of course, a kind. Of, I tried to. I've been. I've been. I made this image of the uh, the image of everything. Everybody has uh, seen it, and I interpreted it. But I wanted to also show people how this image of everything, it's its obviously, there are, there's variation in the way you can represent the kind of the same pattern. You can represent it through different angles. And so I wanted to try to maybe take a few other stories in scripture and represent the same kind of cosmic pattern by emphasizing that particular story, but then all, also emphasizing different aspects of this kind of cosmic pattern because I always always want to be careful people don't um just equate the image with the pattern in itself you know the image is is trying to kind of reveal this pattern to you but it's not the full thing it's it's a it's a it's a clothing right it's a it's an image of something which is invisible and and a, and a pattern which is invisible um all right so so if you look at the, the, we can start with what is referenced in terms of the uh, the image of everything, the Genesis one, where the first one I did. So what I wanted to do, of course, is to try to show it also this, the fractal nature of reality. And so you can understand very easily that this whole image of the Garden of Eden and what's going on there is ultimately is ultimately now in here, where you have the garden in the background and you have the flood coming up to the gates of the garden. So this little hill here with the four rivers and the tree in the center, which is now the tree of life, and which is equivalent, of course, to uh, the cross here in this image. Here I'd only put the two rivers, but um, traditionally it's actually more, it's more usual to show the four rivers of paradise kind of coming down the mountain. So I have the same structure with the four rivers and the tree at the top. An interesting tradition about the flood is there are many people, Saint Seraphim, uh, 
Saint Ephraim, Saint Ephraim the Syrian and other saints talk about how the flood came up to the gates of the garden, but the garden was never flooded. And you can understand that as the idea of this pristine reality, which was preserved, kind of like the ark itself, but it was preserved at the top of the world. It's something like the preserving of the seed or the preserving of the principles that are at our top. And there's some really wild traditions which came out of this idea that the garden wasn't flooded. For example, there are interesting traditions according to which um, according to who according to which Melchizedek was, you know, I forget who it was, someone who was preserved in the Garden of Eden during the flood and then kind of came out afterwards. I forget who he's supposed to be. That's horrible though. That he was preserved in the garden and then uh, came out after the flood, which is why we say that, you know, Melchizedek has no father and mother, that he has no generation, let's say. Um, so are there are different traditions of things that are kept in the, the garden, um, even during the flood, the idea of the tree of life being preserved also in the garden. It's just different ways of explaining the, the problem of the flood and how, you know, despite the flood, you always need to have something which is, which is, preserved above so that then the world can kind of take shape from uh, below again. So this is what I wanted to show in terms of the, uh, the relationship between the, uh, the Garden of Eden and the flood itself. And so the, the image of the tree of life, it's complicated to show the tree of life. And I always struggle to, to do that. It's actually rare that it's shown in iconography. Usually the image which is shown is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So I was wondering how to do that. And what I thought of doing was to base the idea of the tree of life on the image of the glory of God. And so you can see up above this, these three half circles where the, uh, let me close up here a little bit. So if you if you look at this this section here, you can see this is a traditional way of representing the glory of God, which is the idea of the divine darkness, which is behind the glory. So there's a dark circle in the inside and then you see a lighter circle next to it and then a white or very very light circle on the outside. This is something that you'll see often in icons at the top of icons, you'll see it in the icon of uh, of the baptism of Christ. Of theophany, you'll see it also in sometimes the glory of Christ Himself. If you see Christ in the Ascension, or sometimes in the Anastasis, we see Christ descending into hell. You'll see this kind of uh, mandorla that has a dark on the inside and then light on the outside. It really is this idea of something which is beyond name, which is then manifesting itself in identity. But behind this identity is actually something which transcends identity, which is be, which is beyond uh, images, beyond beyond light. Um, and so, what I wanted to do is to kind of in the in the whole image, you'll see there's a lot of reflecting, where there's a sense in which the the cause of something is the reflection of the other. And this is what I wanted to show here, where at the top you have this. Um, this divine darkness, which manifests itself into light. And then in the tree, you have the light at the center, which is kind of darkening as you leave the center. And, and this is based on a lot of traditions about the, the temple, of course, as the temple, you have these thicker veils or the idea, St. Ephraim the Syrian talks about the four rivers of paradise, which as they go down the, 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 the mountain of paradise, get mixed and mitigated and are not as pure as they are at the beginning of their journey, let's say. And so you have this, this sense of this light kind of darkening as you get further and further from the center. But, it, but when, you, when you balance it with this idea of divine darkness, then you, you don't run the risk of just having this, uh, what I could say, a kind of Gnostic vision or a, a simplistic vision where we have this idea that everything that's on the outside is just impure Everything that's dark is just bad, and everything that's light is just good. That's not that's the 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 base the the cosmic pattern is more complex than that. Um, and so so you have the tree of life, which is at the top of the garden. You have the four rivers, and here this is interesting because a lot of people were confused about about these images, the two the two images that are that are next to the uh, that are next to the tree. People were wondering. We're struggling to understand who that was. And what I wanted to represent was something like 
before the before the flood and after the flood. And so the and also the idea of this you could say the relationship between something because there's a there's a pattern in scripture which is that before uh, a flood or before a crossing of waters there's something like uh, an ascension there's something there's something about someone going up and before the flood you have um Enoch and so this is a lot of people thought this was Elijah but it's not Elijah the idea of having Elijah there would make no sense in terms of this story it's Enoch who is ascending into heaven before the flood uh but I'm using the trope of um of Elijah first of all because if you look at very early manuscripts I couldn't find an image of it though I was looking for it before and I I couldn't I, I have it somewhere in my papers or I lost them during the flood, but there are earlier images of um, representations of saints like Enoch in which he's represented in the divine chariot. And so that's also why at the Ascension, Christ, if you look at images of the Ascension, you'll notice they have these wheels under the older versions, especially you have wheels under the angels because it's also Christ ascending into heaven in a divine chariot. And so all the images of Ascension really uh, have this sense of the Merkaba or this divine chariot, which is the vehicle by which the saint uh, sends. And so, so this is Enoch. And then this is actually Noah who is sacrificing after the, um, after the flood. So before the flood, you have this kind of from the dry land, this, this going up of, uh, you know, the Holy one and the going up of the Holy one or the disappearance of the Holy one has something to do with, the 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 flood itself you could say you know or this transformation or this change that's going to happen um and so you it's not necessarily negative but it, there's definitely this the change that's going to happen so you see that with elijah going up as well you also see it with moses's body being taken up um as the before the the israel is able to cross the jordan um to go into the promised land um and there are versions, of course, the, the ascension of Christ himself ends up kind of being the culmination of all that. And then afterwards, you have the sacrifice of Noah. And so you, you have a sense of the, the, the saint going up. And then here you have the, the sacrifice going up, but the blessing coming down as well. So we understand this as this new blessing that God gives to Noah. Um it's hard. It was hard to represent this totally, but you can also understand that at this moment when Noah finishes the flood and is on the mountain, you know, the Mount Ararat, he also receives the law. And so there's a sense in which this new beginning is a sacrifice. It's, it's also the receiving of a new law for the new world, which is about to begin. Um, okay, so let's look into the chat. Some people say, can you explain divine darkness a little more? Um, I would say if you if you're. If you're interested, there are many videos on my channel that talk about this idea of uh, of divine darkness, and uh, especially my chats on Saint Gregor of Nyssa. He talks about divine darkness quite a bit, and so I think that um, I think that you can you can find the answers you're looking for in that because it would be difficult to go into it too much to go into it too much into it right here. Um, okay, so above here, above the the um, the rainbow, we have, of course, this cosmic image. Here you have, let me just back up a little bit. I hope you can see my cursor. Okay, so here you have the sun, and here you have the moon. Um, and, of course, I'm trying to play a little bit with color. I'm not a super, I'm not super good with color, but I was trying to kind of use some, trying to suggest some symbolism with uh, with color, and so there's this, a lot of people have noticed, you know, how in uh, Christ and the Virgin, in some traditions, you'll have Christ with an, with, uh, you know, with with one color inside, one color outside, and the Virgin with the opposite. And so this is what I was kind of trying to suggest: uh, the idea that there, similar to what you have here in the Divine Glory and the Tree of Life, which is that, you know, there's there's a sense in which there's a reflection of causation, and so here you have the blue on the inside and the red on the outside with the blue on the outside and the red on the inside. Um, and so I'm trying to kind of show this, you'll see it all through the image where this, this it's almost like a yin yang image, you know, where you have the white dot and the black and the black part. There's a sense in which uh, the, 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 the motor of something is, 
there's something which you're moving to, which is kind of like you're moving towards not the opposite, but that the vision of the opposite is the drive of your identity, you know? And so as you notice something, let's say, especially in terms of, of, of male and female, you could say, so the, the existence of masculinity uh, manifests itself in a, in a drive towards the feminine and the feminine manifests itself as a drive towards the masculine. And so this relationship is important to understand because opposites are related to each other. They, they don't just exist standalone. They, they're, they're moving towards each other. And so that's probably the best way to see all of this. But it's easier to show it in an image form than it is to explain it. So it's better to just create these patterns of reflection so that people can kind of get us kind of see it and and uh, get a sense of it. So you'll see this all through the image, the two angels, of course, having the same pattern of blue and pink and then pink and blue. Um, and then it goes down through this. So I don't want to talk about the, the, the rainbow right away. We'll talk about the rainbow a little later. Let's talk a, a little more about just a little more about the the flood itself. And so of course, this flood is this the primordial waters that are manifested again. So you can have a sense of this this uh, beginning of Genesis where it talks about the waters of chaos. So this is really these really are the waters of chaos, the same as we could see um, the same waters that you could see in my image of everything, of course. And traditionally, the, the thing with the image of uh, Noah is just how much today it has become, uh, you know, the, the idea that this story of Noah could be like a kid's story and then you could have like little plush toys about it is just, it's just such a, it's just an amazing thing because it's such a, it's, such, it's like the most dramatic story that has ever been told or the most like radically disturbing story that has ever been told. Uh, but here and today for some for reason, it's for kids. And so... And so in the, the ancient images, it was very traditional to show, uh, to show dead bodies in the water. Uh, so for example, you can see in this one, you'll find a similar pattern to what I'm doing. You'll see how it's split in half. And there's the, the right hand of Noah with the white bird, the left hand of Noah with the black bird. Um, I do it a little differently. I really like how these types of images do it. But I for some reason, I couldn't fit it to do it this way in my image, where you see the white bird here coming from Noah. And then on the right side of Noah, you see the white bird finding the branch at the bottom of the image here. And then you see the black bird here feeding on the remainder of the ancient world. And so this is really a, a very deep understanding of the idea of the black bird and the white bird or the left hand and the right hand, where the branch is really the uh, the idea of structure. It, that's what a branch is. It's an it's an it's a structure, and so it's a finding of a pattern. And so the 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 white bird goes off at first, uh, can't find the pattern, so it comes back, and then ultimately it goes, and then it does find the pattern. And so it finds the pattern and brings the the brings the pattern uh, back to to Noah, and the blackbird goes off and doesn't return. And so the idea of it not returning has to do with how it is now, it finds the residue of the old world. And that's what the left hand is. Like that, that's what the kind of symbolism of the, the dark side of the left hand is, which is this idea of, of re recognizing things that aren't part of the identity and seeing them. And so the blackbird goes off and feeds off the, off the residue of the ancient world and usually represented as eating the carcass of a donkey, which makes sense in terms of the donkey already representing the foreigner, the stranger representing the wildness of the wildness that somehow though can still kind of be tamed. But in scripture, the, the, uh, the, the idea of the, the donkey, it really does represent the, the foreign, the strange, that which isn't connected to my pattern. So that's how to understand it. And so you have the pattern from the white bird, and then you have that which is not connected to my pattern uh, related to the uh, the black bird. Um, and so here it's nice because you have, uh, you'll have you have a cow here, which is a pure animal that they could eat on the right side of Noah. You'll have a man who and a woman, and then you have an impure animal, which is the donkey, on the left side of Noah. So all of this 
is very, very intuitively right in terms of, of these images. A lot of these no, ancient Noah images are very powerful in that sense. So now if you look at mine, you'll see that I tried to do something very similar. Um, you can see though on the right hand of Noah, on our left hand, on the right hand of Noah, you have the white bird bringing back the branch to Noah. Um, and so, and what I wanted to suggest was how the, uh, can you see this? Sorry. What I wanted to suggest was how the, the white bird was carrying a little version of the tree of life as the kind of basic pattern of reality. And so I wanted this little branch to, to, to have the same motif as the, as the tree of life as well. And then, and then at the bottom of the image, you have the blackbird feeding on the donkey. You can't get a better image than that. There's no point in even trying. It's such a great, such a great way of representing this. Um, and so similar, similar, I wanted, I have uh, you know, a man on the right hand of Noah, which is which will be re a reflection of the sons of Noah, which on his right hand, and then a woman on the left side of Noah, which is a reflection of his daughters and his wife on his left hand. And so you'll see that there's this kind of reflecting where there's a dead version in the water of that which is alive uh, above. And so, you know, the men, the women, but also at the bottom of the image, I wanted to show the, here you can see there's a chariot which is in the waters. And of course this reflects to the chariot above of uh, the chariot of uh, the chariot of uh, Enoch, this chariot here reflects the chariot of Enoch, but it also reflects the idea of in the flood, not in the flood, but in the crossing of the the waters in the story of uh, Moses. You get a sense that it's really important in the in the song, especially Miriam's song, but in the story that the chariots of the Egyptians are part of the story. And so the, the Egyptians with their chariots get drowned in the sea. And this is also an image of technology or an image of civilization itself. It has to do with the descendants of Cain and how the descendants of Cain developed uh, technology. So the idea that technology gets swept away in this flood or that civilization, the walls of the, 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 of the temple, the walls of the city get swept away. And so this is why also I have the wall of a city here which is of course reflecting the wall of the garden itself. And so this is the, this is all of here is the same thing. So the pattern here is you could say the positive aspect of the pattern. And then down here is the pattern breaking down um, because it was at first it was done pridefully, let's say. So it ends up breaking down. So it's, it's also a way for me to kind of try to help people see that all of it, everything is good if it's in the right place. It's not about things being good or bad. It's it's always about things not being in their proper place, and so, and so you have the the, the wall of the city. Of course, I wanted to put a warrior with a helmet and a sword, and I want to make the warrior a, a little bigger than the one there, just to suggest the giants kind of getting uh, swept up in all of this. And and of course, the the giant here that is getting swept up in the flood is a reflection of the angels up here um, who are properly in their place and not doing any of that um, any of that uh, intermingling that they're not supposed to be doing with the humans. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna what I'll do is I'll I'll get through this and then I'll I'll do I'll do the two super chats at the end, because I'm seeing people are putting in super chats. So I will do the super chats, but I'll do it the way that I usually do at the end of the, of the conversation so that I don't kind of break the flow of what I'm trying to explain. Um, so I've got until 11. I'll, I'll stop a little before 11. So we should be able to get through all this and the super chats as well. Okay, and so, so I've got pretty much down here. So of course I wanted to show the fish down here and the fish, you know, their living places in the water. And so they represent the, the possibilities of fish, uh, the possibilities of life in the water. I wanted to have like a blue and a red fish just to show, the, let's say, the positive and negative or the inside outside aspect of the fish as well. <clears throat> of course, the fish will become an image, a very important image for Christians because they represent Christ going down. in. So look at the Christ goes down into all of this 
goes down into the mouth of hell to get the little fishies, you know, to come and uh, fish us out of the, the, the death. It might seem quaint, but it's not quaint. It really is uh, very much an image of what Christ is representing. And so I wanted to help people see that it's in the flood, you already get a sense that Christ is not afraid of the flood. Like Christ will dive into the flood and uh, is willing to go get the life hidden that is even hidden down in the depth of that, of that flood. So that's why I wanted to have the little fishies down there. Uh, and so, of course, here, I forgot this part. Of course, here you have an altar, which is, uh, which is now flooded as well. Um, and it was mostly to show, let's say, the, the, you could say the wrong sacrifice. You can imagine it as the sacrifice of Cain, the, the sacrifice which, which, which was rejected by God. Um, that's what ends up now getting flooded in the water. All right, so let's look at the ark. And so there's so many interesting ways of doing the ark. And man, it's hard to choose because the, the ancients, let me show you a few really amazing images of, uh, of arcs. Um, okay, so this is an image of the ark that I really love because the ark is represented just like a simple house. Um, here you can see again, you can see how uh, the, the sons of Noah and the daughters of Noah and his wife are separated the way that I did. It's flipped, but it's still the same meaning. And then you have the images of the animals below in this kind of tiered structure. This is really a very, very, to me, it's just the, the basic sense of, of a, a good way to represent the art. Here's another version of that one, um, which I like a lot. Because in this one, you also have the daughters, the, the daughters and wife's uh, wife of, of Noah. You have his sons. You have um, the bird bringing the branch back to Noah here. And in the ark, you have like a hierarchy of animals, which I really like. Down here, you have the dead man, dead woman, like I did. And then you also have the bird eating a guy now, <laughs> which is a little intense for me. I didn't want to go all the way there. Uh, eating a human person. Uh, but then you see the bird here uh, getting the branch from the tree. And there's like an interesting hierarchy of animals here where the birds are represented above. So you can see all of here, you have these different birds. Then you have a representation of what could be called the tame animals, right? Or the animals that we kind of understand in terms of in terms of, you know, a, a donkey, a horse, uh, you know, a sheep, uh, cows, all of these kind of animals that we, uh, pigs, gazelles, these animals that we're encountering. And as you get lower, then you get all the funky animals. And so you have these like chimera creatures down here and you have a uh, griffin and, uh, and uh, you even have, look at this. You even have monsters down here. Can you see the monsters people down here? It's amazing. It's like, I, man, I love the middle ages so much. Uh, so down here you have these like little you have these little monsters there. Um, so if you want to know where why there's still monsters after the flood, that's because it seems some of them were taken into the ark, according to the medievals. And so it ends up being a cosmic image. Like I mean, that's the idea. It's like you know when I talk to you about the map of the world and how you have so imagine now the map of the world with the humans in the center, and then as you get further you have these stranger and stranger things. And that's why just naturally they will, they will have tended to put these monsters on the edge of the arc. Let's like at the bottom of the arc, close to the edge of the world. And so the arc being a kind of cosmic image, um, they just would make sense that you would do it that way. It's very intuitive. Um, and so there was something also I liked about the idea of, I, I don't think you can see this. Let me just, oh, you can't see it because it's not late. All right, so I wanted to, I really wanted to have, I like this version uh, quite a bit because the, the birds are kind of at the top of the ark. And I really like the idea of the, the ark having an animal quality to it itself. You know, and it's not just in the ark, at boats in general, the, you have this idea of the kind of the Viking ship or these different, um, ships that would have an animal at the mast at the head of the, the ship. So I really, I really enjoyed, I really like this idea of having the animals coming into the ark, but the ark itself 
as having a, uh, a kind of animal quality to it. And so that's why I made my arc with a little dragon's head here at the top of the arc. Because there's something about the arc that is animality itself. That, that's, it's not all that. There's more, but there is an aspect of it. And so you can also understand it as a church. If you understand the arc as the church, then you also understand that the gargoyle the gargoyle is on the outside. And so I didn't put my monsters inside the ark like those medievals that had a lot of gall to do that. I actually put my monster on the outside of the ark so that the gargoyle is uh, is uh, is on the outside, just like in a church, which makes total sense. All right. So we're actually almost done, I think, in terms of explaining it, basically. Um, and so... At the bottom, I forgot to talk about the bottom of the image. And so at the bottom of the image, you really have uh, what's known as the mouth of Hades, the mouth of death. Um, those of you that are following the Lord of Spirits podcast, you will have, you know, uh, Father Stephen and Father Andrew talked about the mouth of death. There are different ways of representing this mouth. Often it's represented sideways like this. This is often how it's represented in images of the last judgment in terms orthodox images of the last judgment. So you can see down here, you have this kind of image of the mouth of death. So you have Christ, the judgment, and then all these, these, uh, these souls going into this, this mouth of, of Hades, but it is also often represented uh, the way I did, which is from below this kind of mouth looking up. Um, and so, I mean, it's totally fine to, to to represent it in different ways. I really like, I like this version for what I was doing because I wanted, I also wanted the uh, the mouth of hell to to be represented like a container, you know, like this kind of this this unholy vase you could say that's at the bottom of the world and it's kind of devouring things, um, like the bottom of the ocean, something like that. And so that's how I'd really like the idea. And also, of course, that it's upside down it makes a, it is so easy to, so intuitive to, of course, understand the mouth of death as being kind of upside down and being the reverse of the, the rainbow. Um, all right, so on the ark now, we have the, the sons of Adam on his right hand and the, oops, sorry, and the, um, the daughters, uh, not Adam, the the sons of Noah on his right hand and the daughters of Noah on his left hand. And so this is where I was trying to kind of play a little bit more, you know, the, trying to experiment a little bit with color. I'm not used to using color as I am a carver, as you all know. But I wanted to, so I have, um, I have Noah with white, white with dark uh, shadow, let's say, or dark reflection. And then I wanted his wife to be kind of dark with light reflection. Um, and then his sons are the primary colors and the, and the daughters are the, the secondary colors. And so that was the idea because it's, it's almost like you also understand that it's like the rainbow playing itself out as well in the world. And so the rainbow has all the primary and secondary colors in it. You know, it's six colors. Uh, and so that's what I wanted to have uh, down here. And so you can see that, you know, I have at the right hand of, of Noah, the white bird that is the same white bird as here. And then on his left, you have the black bird, which is the same black bird that goes down and eats the, the donkey. And then I wanted to have this interesting mirror that I've been talking about where I have the secondary colors uh, as the birds above the, the sons of Noah, and then have the primary colors as the birds above the daughters of Noah and to kind of have this idea of, of this kind of idea of this mirrored causality, this causality in, in opposites that, that I wanted to suggest. And so of course the birds being at the top are like angels or principalities at a lower level or representation of principalities. Um, just like this, these angels that are above here. And so, and so now we come to the rainbow itself. And so, so I really wanted the rainbow to be like the dome of heaven itself, you know, and kind of separate this cosmic aspect up here, the stars as, as uh, the, let's say the immovable stars as these principalities that are, that are really, really high and really abstract, and then have 
this lower pattern under the under the dome of heaven, which is paradise, which is you know the the ascension of Enoch, and then the sacrifice, which starts the next world. So kind of like the end and the beginning, and this and this place where it all comes together in paradise. So of course, then now the rainbow becomes this. This multiplicity above, you could say, uh, and also an image of the limit at the same time. The rainbow is very is a very interesting has a very interesting symbolism because it is multiplicity, and so you always have to kind of understand the rainbow as a circle. Uh, but the circle, the, this multiplicity is above and below, and so there's a relationship. But I wanted to for sure show the white light as the source of the rainbow, so that's why I have the chrism. Um, the key row, the, the, this is a, an image of the first two letters of Christ. So uh, ke, like this, and a row with the, what looks like a P uh, is the second letter in the name of Christ. And what looks like an X is the first letter. But what's mostly important in this, why I chose this, except besides a cross, like I could have put a cross there, the, the more modern, the later images would tend to have a cross. But the reason why I chose the key row was to really emphasize the six. So you have one. Right, one, you have six points, um, which are the six colors of the rainbow, which are now in a white circle, which is the origin of the six colors. And so the idea of pure light or transparent light as being the, the, uh, the origin of, the, of multiplicity, as being the, the source of multiplicity. And so that is, the, uh, that is the basic idea. I don't know if I'm missing anything. All right, let me look into the uh, into the chat. Let's see if people have uh, questions. If you have, so I'll look at the super chat. But if you have questions, feel like there's something I haven't talked about, um, I will I will uh, answer. And so Landabort for five dollars US says, do you have any insight into the Old Testament liturgical symbolism and how the patterns show? Shown to Moses on the mountain, continue into the divine liturgy. I mean, of course, it, it's not, it's not a, the church itself is based on a three part, a three tiered structure, which is the same structure as the tabernacle or the temple. And so you have an outside, you have an intermediary space, and then you have a total inside. So in my image, for example, in this in the image of this, you also have a three-tiered structure, you could say. Uh, you basically have, I mean, you can see it different in different ways, but you you have, let's say here, this would be something like the altar area where you have the, the incarnate pattern, you could say, or the, the, the top of the mountain, the place where heaven and earth meet would be up here. And so you can understand all of the garden here as the, as the altar area in the church. Um, and then the, the, this is the nave. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, let's say that the top part would be the nave maybe. And then this would be the narthex, the transition space. Oh, what I forgot to explain was the animals. I forgot to explain the logic of the animals. My goodness. Why didn't anybody tell me in chat? Or I'm not looking enough in the chat to, to see that if anybody's actually talking about it. Um, all right, so I the, the logic of the animals was something that I thought about for months. Oh, man, it's so hard to get it right because there are different ways to do it, but uh, it's really fascinating to see, you know, how different people do it. So here again, in this version of the arc, you see the adults on top, then you see the birds, um, and then you see the animals, but it doesn't seem like there's a logic in the animals, why they're shown there. And the other one I showed you, there was definitely a logic in the way the animals were uh, represented. And so my attempt, let's say, was to, sep to, have, to have a sense of, have a sense of uh, like two tiers. So it's three tiers, the, the, the arc itself is, is three tiers to, to kind of be a microcosm, let's say, of the whole thing, which is the three tiers in the Old Testament symbolism. And so, you have on the right side here at the top, you have pure animals, okay, from the Old Testament rules. And on the left side, you have impure animals, okay? 
Now, I wanted to have the lamb and the, the lion next to each other to kind of represent the possibility of, the, of paradise, right? This idea of the lamb and the lion laying together that we see in scripture. And, but I wanted to have them uh, across from each other and made sense. It, it was great because, of course, the lamb is the animal of sacrifice too, you know, and the lion is the animal of royalty. And so there's something about that in terms of, of let's say, power, authority and power, let's say, priestly and uh, kingly, let's say, was also part of that. But I also wanted, so the animals on the right hand to be pure, but going towards, so the going towards the giraffe, which a giraffe is actually a pure animal in the scripture, but it's a foreign, it's still exotic, it's still strange. So it's like a strange animal that you can eat. Um, and then on the left hand, I wanted the impure animals. And so the lion who is impure, but it also represents uh, the king. Um, and then the donkey, which is impure, but also, rep you know, if you think about the idea of the stranger that can be saved, you get a sense in scripture when Christ enters into Jerusalem on the, the, the back of a donkey, there's a sense in which it's also potentiality that can be mastered or, or you know, that, that can be embodied and can participate in the pattern. And then the dogs, uh, you know, it's all, it's all St. Christopher, but there's also in the description of the New Jerusalem, it says the dogs will be excluded from the New Jerusalem. And so it was to have them, I still wanted them in there because there's also a way in which Christ talks about the dogs receiving the crumbs which fall from the table. Um, and so I wanted them, the dog, to be there on the edge, receiving the crumbs from the table, you could say. Um, all right. So down here is is very fascinating what happened because I didn't wasn't sure how to do it. Like, I wasn't totally sure how to do it. So I wanted to have, it was hard because I wanted to have the creepy crawlers down there or the lower animals, um, you know, the 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 pig uh, as the boar or the pig as an image of this wildness. Um, but there's also, there's some interesting, uh, interesting ideas of the pig, like interesting legends, especially like Jewish legends about the idea of a kosher pig or a pig that will learn to, that will kind of learn to, uh, to be reintegrated, let's say. But so that was kind of the idea of trying to have the pig down here. But then the other ones, I wanted the snake on the edge on the left, of course, because of, of the fall. Um, and, you know, I wanted the locusts here because you can eat them. They're actually a pure animal. But it was, it was kind of struggling. But something someone showed me that I didn't even realize was how these three, the, the locusts, the rats, and the, the frogs, they're the plagues of Egypt. And I didn't think of that at all when I did it. Uh, but it's just interesting that I ended up lining them up. I could have chosen any animal, like I, all, any kind of, of of beast. But I ended up, for some reason, choosing these these uh, these three animals next to each other to represent the the plagues of Egypt. And I didn't plan it, so it's interesting. Um, and so I wanted like, and so you can eat locusts, which is makes them pure creepy crawl crawlers. But you can't eat uh, other other bugs. Like there's all these other bugs you can't eat, which aren't which are, you know. Even though they're trying to get us to eat bugs, you can't eat, you're not supposed to eat bugs, at least not in the Old Testament. I mean, in the New Testament theory, you probably could, but man, let's not eat bugs. All right. Uh, so that was that. That's the animals. All right. Okay. So let me, sorry, let me go back into the, let me go back into now the super chats because I kind of started and then I stopped. All right. I got like 10 minutes. So let's try to do this. Uh, so Mike Larive says if opposites are driving toward each other, then how do you understand Christ and Satan as being being opposites? I don't. I don't understand Christ and Satan as being opposites. Um, I don't. I don't think that's a that's a good uh, a good way to understand opposites in that terms. It'd be like Michael and Satan are opposites, um, and so they define each other. They also define each other sometimes not necessarily in this same productive way. And so imagine Michael killing the dragon, and so that's also a kind of relationship of opposites where one is defining each other, but it's also a hostile relationship. And so let's say Michael and Satan are more like the so-called, you know, Jung gets it so wrong when he says Christ and Satan are the, the brothers or whatever. It's That's total nonsense. They're not. It's like Michael and Satan at, at, in, are, are closer to the image of the hostile brothers. Definitely not Christ and Satan. Um, Christ contains all of it. Christ contains 
a lot of people won't understand it when I say it. I'm not saying Christ is is the devil, but Christ contains, uh, let's say, everything about the devil which can be saved is contained in Christ. Let's say it that way, to to avoid uh, to avoid confusing people. Um, so James Critti for five. Hey James, good to see you by the way. The incarnation of Christ necessitates the eventual emergence of Antichrist, right? And you considered expressing this latter part pattern in your art. Um, I mean, it's, yes, it's there. It's already there in, in certain images in terms of liturgical images where you have a sense of, uh, you know, for example, images of the Last Supper. In the images of the Last Supper, you really get a sense of uh, Judas as this Antichrist figure. You see it in images like the, the betrayal of Judas where Judas kisses uh, Christ. And so it's already there in liturgical art. But, um, I mean, in terms of my, like, that's what my art is. My art is liturgical arts. I just follow the patterns that have been given to me. Um, but in terms of the image of everything, it's there. The mouth of hell has this kind of antichrist idea. You know, the Leviathan has a kind of antichrist idea. Uh, but it's not exactly the same. I agree with you. Um, it's definitely worth, the, the the image of antichrist is definitely very, very worth thinking about and trying to discern because it's, it says that maybe even the believers will be uh, duped, you know? Um, so James, so solved, uh, gave $5. Thanks. So uh, solved zero James, James again, ask if I wanted to do an embodied symbolic world gathering, maybe some speakers and a surprise appearance by a certain enigmatic familial figure. Wouldn't that be great? I think so. I would love to do that. It's just, I mean, COVID made everything complicated. So I don't know how that's going to play out, but I think it would be definitely be great to have uh, to organize an event. Richard Rowland is talking about doing something like that, which would be in uh, in in uh, like organized also with the publishing of a book, which was kind of bring together a lot of the symbolic world and symbolic world adjacent thinkers. So I think in the next few years we're going to see that happen if if we're if we're allowed to travel and stuff. So. So Douglas Horch for five dollars says he agrees with James, and he says let's have a symbolic world party at the edge of the world. Yeah, let's do it. I'm totally for it. I definitely would love to do that. All right. So Jeremy Firth for ten dollars says he's a little bit late, but he says who are the royal figures associated with the sun and the moon above the rainbow? And so these are traditional ways of representing the sun and moon, uh, which is to represent one as a king and a queen. Uh, and so a way to understand it is to understand it exactly as that. It says in scripture that God made the sun to rule the day and the lesser light, the moon, to rule the night. So you can understand that in terms of a masculine uh, principality, like a king. You can understand the moon as a feminine principality, like the, you know, uh, like that rules over the night. So it's like light and dark, uh, you know. So that's the traditional way of representing them. Sometimes they're not represented male and female. Sometimes they're just ambiguous, but often they're represented as male and female, not just in Christianity, but in also pagan cultures as well. Um, and, you know, uh, Father Stephen and Father Andrew on the Lord of Spirits, they've been talking about how it, it's there's also a sense in which these images are represent the principalities which govern these bodies. That is, the sun is not just the big ball of flaming gas. You know, the fact that it it rules over our lives, it rules over our existence, means that behind the sun, there's also uh, uh, a principality. And you see this principality kind of submitting to Christ in, in the image of the crucifixion, kind of hiding themselves, uh, you know, in, in, in this kind of reverence towards Christ in, in the crucifixion. And you see similar images, other kind of similar images as well. All right, so Taylor Lur Lewis, uh, fifty dollars, fifty R. I don't know what R is, but thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, and so I think, right? Let's see. Okay, so here uh, AC for fifty dollars US. Are you familiar with Corbin's interpretation of the flood as flood soft gnosis? The dogmatic refuses to build a new ark for, but with floods of gnosis, demonic self crowning is all you get, and battle for lost speech comes. I'm not sure. I don't know if there's something wrong with the way that you uh, floods of gnosis. Um, 
the dogmatic refuses to build a new ark for? I mean, I don't know. I've never read Corbin's, Corbin's interpretation. I haven't read a lot of Corbin. I've read some, but not not a lot. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I don't think that. Uh, I don't like that it's used the word gnosis. It it could be. You could. It could be a flood of information. That could definitely be a way to understand it, in the sense that sometimes a flood happens when new facts emerge, and so these facts appear, and so you have to, if you're not able to kind of build an arc from the old world, then everything's going to get dissolved because all of a sudden things don't fit anymore, right? You know, you have to adjust the pattern to the emergent facts to a certain extent. You have to be able to, 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 to adjust it or else it's going to, it's going to break. So you can see how, um, you could say that one of the things that happened in the scientific era was an incapacity to do that, where all these scientific facts were kind of appearing and religious people tried to resist the facts or or maladjust to the facts. And that's one of the things that created the um, that's one of the things that created the problem of modernism, you know, which is that you have this alien, you have this kind of schizophrenic worldview, where on the one hand, you you have these mythological spiritual patterns on the other hand you have the scientific kind of uh vision of the world and you can't fit them together and so because of it you have this alienation and those that try to fit it together are doing it in all kinds of weird ways and uh you know and it doesn't it just doesn't jive so it doesn't doesn't work so maybe that way i could understand it but um the word gnosis for me has a very particular meaning especially a christian meaning it has similar to the sense of symbolism which is really this joining of heaven and earth that's where gnosis happens um so all right guys so yeah i i said i would stop a little bit for 11 and i think we got through everything um and so i'm really i'm really happy to see everybody uh show up in the chat it was a lot of fun and so let me see all right so so yeah so so i i i might do this i might do this more often if it's easy, because I kind of I kind of like the direct contact as well, um, and it, uh, it it's less complicated. I don't have to kind of edit everything and think it out. I can make mistakes, and you all forgive me because you'll know it's a live chat. So thanks for your support, everybody. Thanks for your attention. There are more videos coming soon. My next video that's coming up will be a discussion with uh, Vodulaskin, the author of Loris, which I recorded a few weeks ago, and uh, more discussion with Richard Rowland are coming down the line as well as well as my video on the mark of the beast which uh which which i want to make sure i get right before i put out so so thanks everybody and i'll talk to you very soon